but we know we have platelets. We know we have neutrophils. Now we really don't have macrophages. Macrophages are more tissue specific. We have monocytes in there. And we're gonna get into the very, very important uh, aspects of monocytes. We have some fibroblasts. We have some endothelial cells. We have some HSCs, believe it or not. Oops, let me go back a bit. And we also have what is a very interesting cell to me called a pluripotent embryonic-like stem cell. So that's pretty much what's it in there. And now we're gonna kind of dissect it a little more. Now, one thing we need to kind of be aware of is what I call the crines of cellular communication. We have autocrine, we have juxtacrine, paracrine. Paracrine is how many of our cells work in regenerative medicine. They basically affect local cells. And then of course we have the endocrine. And this kind of is a very good diagram that explains all of that, okay? Now, one of your speakers is Dr. Lana, who's my good personal friend. He and I published a paper a few years ago on the classification of PRP. And we took into account how it's harvested, how it's activated, number of red cells, number of spins, image guidance, leukocyte number, very, very important, okay? And last but not least is light activation, okay? Now, one thing I wanna make everyone aware of, a lot of people know about exosomes, but the, uh, there's also a, an exosome-like product that comes from platelets. These are called platelet-derived microparticles. They're actually more numerous than exosomes even. And we think possibly they may actually replace exosomes in our treatment protocols. We still have a lot to learn about exosomes and I'll get into that a little bit later on in the lecture, okay? But basically when we're looking at um, platelet exosomes, it's very similar to stem cell exosomes. You have damaged tissue, you have a stem cell and the exosome can actually help re repair and differentiation. But look at your activated platelets, can do the same thing, damage tissue repair activated platelets. So they're very similar. Now, we've gotten a technique in my office to obtain these by very high speed specification. Um, and I'll have a slide that shows that in just a moment, but you can see, again, very much like an exosome, these platelet microparticles have very much um, facets in all different parts of the immune system, tumors, uh, monocytes, etc. Now, here's um, another slide that shows the same thing. Again, how these microparticles can really influence many aspects in the body. Now I was talking about how we, we this is a special syringe, a note for syringe, or excuse me, a test tube that we use to obtain these um, uh, particles. And we do it by very high speed uh, centrifugation. All right now what I wanna get into is what I call the urban legends of PRP and things like that. For instance, as a, a real, misconception, so to speak, that leukocyte-rich PRP should not be used in a joint. And I wanna show the science as to why that is. Now, you know, the perception is pure PRP, which is leukocyte poor, can basically make things work better, particularly in a joint. Now, sometimes some people will admit it works better in a tendon. But let me tell you, this is really not supported by very much literature of using a leukocyte uh, poor PRP in a joint. And we're gonna get into that as to why. Now. One of the best articles you can read is a number of articles by Dr. Parrish et al. Uh, this is one good article right here in uh, Musculoskeletal Regeneration. And what he's saying is that the non-platelet components of a PRP such as um, red cells and leukocytes are essential for normal platelet function including growth factor release. This is a very important concept. We'll get into that in a moment. Now, what effects do RBCs have? Well, some people say, oh my God, RBCs are very detrimental to the joint. Look at a hemophiliac. Yes, in a hemophiliac with multiple bleeds, that could be a problem. But when we look at the real science, activated RBCs can accelerate and amplify thrombin generation. Very important because the thrombin can help platelets become activated. Also, RBCs can indeed help stimulate phagocytosis, which can actually result in the uh, release of interleukin-10 and TGF-1 beta. Now, this concept of RBCs being very inflammatory, I'll give you a good, couple of good examples where they're really probably not. You have a patient with an acute ACL tear. He has pain, maybe from the hemoarthrosis, from the pressure, but he doesn't get really an inflammatory response, okay, number one. Number two, you have a patient with a spinal leak from an epidural. What's your treatment of choice? You put basically whole blood patch right on top of the door. So if RBCs were so inflammatory, you certainly wouldn't want to put that on top of the door. Now, RBC, excuse me, WBCs, what is the importance of that? Well, 
Parrish had some very good studies on that. And this next picture is worth many, many words here. But what he's showing us is the following. If you have a, a bacterial infection, a viral infection, you'll have an RB, excuse me, a WBC, a prime neutrophil that becomes activated. And when an activated neutrophil exists, we get various inflammatory growth factors, interleukin-1, uh, TNF, et cetera. Now, if that resting neutrophil becomes primed, but not activated, and that's the key, it becomes anti-inflammatory. And this is exactly what we get when we have an aseptic injection, when we're doing regenerative medicine. We're not dealing with bacterial infections. We're dealing with this. And what do we get from these eventually? We get TGF-beta, interleukin-10, and interleukin-1 antagonist. These are things that actually help with regeneration of tissue. That is why you really do not want to get rid of these um, entities. So uh, basically, you can see here was a study where they said, well, leukocyte rich, leukocyte poor, actually similar safety profiles. So there really does not have much in a way of a, a big difference in them. So the bottom line is what Parrish said is, yes, granted, when you use a leukocyte rich uh, PRP product, you're probably going to get more of an inflammatory response in that joint. But what that's probably meaning is you're probably getting a better uh, preparation, a more efficient PRP product. So just keep that in mind. I've been using leukocyte rich for 10 years. I've done thousands upon thousands of cases and we have no problem getting excellent results. Now, what else may improve your PRP efficiency? Well, we know that low temperatures can actually have a very good effect on PRP. Now, four degrees centigrade, if you were to, uh, to put your PRP in that temperature for 10 to 20 minutes, it can significantly release growth factors. Four degrees centigrade is a very magic number in the world of regenerative medicine. There's a couple of different cells that can really get turned on by that. Now, another interesting fact is that if we can reduce the plasma concentration down to about a 25% concentration, that is also very important for releasing more growth factors. There's actually been a study recently where they took old blood and they diluted it down with saline and albumin to 25% plasma concentration and patients seem to have some reversal of age here and there. That was just released, I think, last week. Okay? Now, another thing we can talk about is A2M. Uh, one of my speakers here, Dr. DeCastro, has had excellent results using A2M on neuropathy. Uh, and he can you know, speak on this, uh, I'm sure, uh, sometime or other. But A2M is basically produced in the liver and it's also made locally by macrophages. And it seems to have some very good um, attributes to it. It can help uh, reduce inflammation and it seems to work exceptionally well for a lot of people. Now, another mention I'm going to make here is something called Regenokine or Orthokine. And this is very popular in Germany by Dr. Peter Willing. What he's doing is he's basically getting whole blood He's incubating it with glass beads for about three or four hours at pretty much body temperature. Again, temperatures are very important in the regenerative world uh, because it can have, you know, a high temperature, low temperature can have various effects. But basically what you're getting with your genokine is interleukin-1 antagonist, basically IRAP. I've used it. It's, it's questionably legal in the United States, but I've used it in a number of cases with excellent results. I also practice in the Cayman Islands and we use it there extensively and have good results with it. I use that though on my patients who didn't get quite the results I wanted them to get when I'm using bone marrow fat PRP. So it's a good regenerative medicine thing to fall back on. Now, one thing a lot of docs don't get the, the difference between is, high, is, excuse me, is angiogenesis and vascular genesis. And to be a regenerative medicine doctor, you really need to know the difference of this. Now, when you're dealing with angiogenesis, you're building on blood vessels that are already there, okay? You're basically making them um, increase the number. Typically, it's uh, evaluated, excuse me, it's initiated by VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Whereas vasculogenesis, you're basically, you have no um, vessels to begin with, and you're going ahead and using certain growth factors such as SDF1 to actually improve and make blood vessels. Now, what's the practicality of this? Well, if you have an area in the body that you're treating that already has some vessels to it, you probably will do fine by just using a PRP, which is very rich in VEGF, but really not so high in SDF1, okay? 
Whereas if you have an area such as a joint where there's not much of a blood supply, you probably need to use stem cells from the get-go. PRP alone may not work so well. So that's the clinical implications there, okay? Now we'll move on to stem cells themselves, okay? Now, stem cells uh, basically are um, self-renewing. They're long-lived. They have a very low proliferative capacity, typically, whereas progenitor cells are pretty much the opposite of that, okay? Now, a cell can be multipotent. Uh, it can also be unipotent, a stem cell. It doesn't have to be multipotent. Okay, now, this is a concept that we all need to know about because this is becoming very prominent in regenerative medicine the difference between a quiescent cell and a senescent cell, okay? A quiescent cell is one that basically is able to still undergo cell division when the proper stimulation is applied. A senescent cell, on the other hand, can no longer undergo cell division. It's a cell that essentially should have died, but it continues to stay alive, so to speak. It's not reproducing but it's producing certain inflammatory growth factors and things like that. Now, what do we basically get? How does a senescent cell come into being? Well, there's some epigenetic factors, you know, how it affects your genes. Telomere erosion seems to be a, a very prominent cause of this. DNA damage, and like many things in the regenerative world, mitochondrial dysfunction. That causes cell senescence, okay, not quiescence now. Now, when you have cell senescence, what happens? You'll get stem cell exhaustion, you'll get chronic inflammation, and that's the real key, the chronic inflammation leading to metabolic X syndrome, leading to cancer, leading to diabetes, and leading to failure in your regenerative medicine procedures. Okay, so basically senescent cells are a huge problem. There are now companies devoted solely to making senolytic agents, agents that actually kill these cells, and we'll get into that shortly here. Now, one of, the, one of the regimens that I like to follow sometimes in my office, Kershaptin, which is an over-the-counter supplement, and Distinibit, okay? Distinibit is a leukemia medicine. We're using it off-label. We give basically one dose, depending on the weight of the patient, and a week later, we'll give them a second dose. And we'll do this for patients with osteoarthritis, and we have significant improvement. I've used it on myself. I have some arthritis of my knees. It helps me, and it helps me very well. Okay. Um, here's an article from The Lancet, 2019. They were treating pulmonary fibrosis just with these two compounds I was talking about. Okay. Um, so this is bringing us to the field of sinotherapeutics. For instance, John Hopkins University is doing a very specific study now on something called UXB0101, where they're basically giving oral medications for people with osteoarthritis in the knees and getting significant improvement. So you have to use these synolytic agents you have to use cinemorphics, which basically modulate the functions of these senescent cells. But eventually, the immune system has to take care of these cells. It has to clear them out. Okay? And this is what you have to realize, all the bad things that these senescent cells will make. So if you want to improve your regenerative medicine uh, results, treat your patient first for some senescent cells. Real simple. If nothing else, give them some quercetin, And that's going to help quite a bit. All right, I wanna move on to stem cell identification. Again, I'm just trying to give everybody a nice broad overview. Many times we'll talk about CD. We say, okay, CD this, CD 70, CD 34. What does it actually mean? Well, it means cluster of differentiation. It's a cell surface molecule, a cell surface marker. And it can tell us a lot about the cell. You can see down here, CD 34 is a hematopoietic stem cell. CD 70 is an MSC. So those, those that CD classification kind of gives us an idea of what that cell is and what it's capable of doing, okay? Now, basically, when we're talking about autogenous, uh, autogenous cells, what kind of cells are there? Well, we have embryonic, we have mesenchymal, hematopoietic, IPS, which are interesting cells, B cells, mu cells, and other cells. So kind of let's talk about these. Well, embryonic cells, not to be confused with umbilical cells, uh, they have some advantages in that they're pluripotent, high level of plasticity, but the disadvantages far outweigh the advantages. There may be some religious and, and other ethical concerns about these cells, but putting them aside as a scientist, basically these cells are very dangerous because they can um, cause what they call a graft versus host disease. They can uh, cause disease transmission. Uh, they don't really clone too well and really not 
much that we could use with these. They can also form tumors, teratomas and things like that. Now, one thing we should know about an embryonic cell that's pertinent for clinical work is these cells have something called the Yamanaka factors, okay? These are basically uh, these factors that can uh, use transcription of genes and things like that. Now, these factors are, are such, OC4, SOC2, uh, and these other ones here, down, down below here. Now, when you see those in certain kind of cells, that gives you an indication that these cells may be pluripotent. These cells have a high ability to basically uh, translate into various different kinds of cells, high plasticity. Now, when we're talking about an iPS cell, I'll take a skin cell from you, I'll treat it with either a virus or an enzyme, and I can make it turn into a uh, pluripotent type stem cell. The good news is, because it's your own cell, we lose some of that uh, autoimmune type problem. We don't, we don't really have a problem where it's, the body's gonna attack the cell. But the problem is when we start treating these with a virus, sometimes we can turn on something called an oncogene, which is basically cancer. So we're finding some good results also with enzymes, but these cells, I think in the future are gonna be very important. Uh, we may use them for disease modeling, but eventually I think we're gonna use these on the patients themselves. So you can see here, patient-specific cell therapy, drug screening, human disease models. So again, your skin cell, we kind of change that DNA a bit and we reprogram it and we have sort of like an IPS cell or induced pro-potential stem cell. Now, somatic nuclear transfer, interesting, so this is where we basically get an unfertilized egg, we take out the nucleus, we take a nucleus from one of your cells and we put it in an unfertilized egg, and voila, we start getting reproduction of cells. This is essentially cloning, okay? So this is a slippery slope for us to follow. Now, there may be some good in this in that maybe we can grow body parts, we can grow hearts, we can grow uh, lungs, etc. And there's some interesting facts about this. From the University of Oregon, what they found is when you take that nucleus from an adult cell and you put it in an embryo, uh, or I should say in an unfertilized egg, the telomeres, the ends of the DNA, start getting longer in length. You're basically making that cell go back in age, which is quite an interesting fact. But this is still something in the future, something we're not gonna do right now. Now, here's one of my more uh, favorite cells to deal with. I've been using these cells for 10 years now, probably. Very small embryonic-like stem cells. There's a lot of different names for these cells, blastomeres, stem bio cells, V cells, et cetera. These cells are pluripotent, okay? They're found in each and every one of us. Interestingly enough, they make telomerase, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing about these cells. They're thought to maybe be an early CD, or about one third the size of a regular adult cell. They're formed in the bone marrow, but typically they're quiescent. Remember, a quiescent cell is one that's capable of reproducing with the right circumstances. Now, we basically have ways of stimulating the bone marrow to produce these cells. One of them is uh, injection of vitamin A. Another one is um, CoQ10. Another one is an enzyme, excuse me, is a uh, algae from Okinawa called phacoidin. But what we do is once we take the blood from the patient, we process it, the real trick here is four degrees centigrade. Remember I told you that four degrees centigrade for PRP? Well, guess what? Four degrees centigrade and hypoxia seem to stimulate these cells and they now become active. Now these cells are also found in non-centrifuge bone marrow. And that's an important aspect when we get into bone marrow. But here's an interesting thing about these you know, cells. When these cells were given back to the patient intravenously, they found that the telomere length of the cells of the immune system increased in length. What you did is you made the patient's basically immune system healthier and younger. Important thing. Okay. So interesting thing about these cells, and it's, a, it's an aspect that's found in all regenerative medicine, essentially. Parathyroid hormone seems to really have a very positive effect on these cells. The trick is to know how, when, and where to use it. These cells have a specific marker for PTH, but guess what? Most of your stem cells have the same kind of marker. Here's an article from NIH, and what they say here, they said that parathyroid hormone, basically tetrapeptide, is a chondroregenerative therapy for injury-induced osteoarthritis. So PTH can, and intermittently can actually help chondroregeneration. Here's some more interesting things about it. Intermittent PTH causes mobilization of progenitor cells from the bone marrow into the bloodstream. 
So not only are you going to basically get more stem cells in your bloodstream, you're also going to get a, a very good effect on regenerating articular cartilage. And there's one more article right here again. So I use this in a, in a very special way on all of my patients. No matter what they get, they get a little bit of this PTH. I have a very inexpensive way of doing it, and I can always share it with you guys down the road. Now, MSCs. At one time, we thought the MSC was the king of the stem cell world. Um, no longer is that the case. If you talk to Artie Kaplan, uh, Case Western, he'll say, well, I'm not even sure that MSCs are even stem cells. Um, so basically, uh, let's look at This is from one of Kaplan's work, and it just gives you an idea of all the various aspects of the stem cells. I put that in there so you can really study this slide. This slide, you can take an hour looking at it because there's so many different things about it, okay? But basically what we now realizing is MSCs are very important for immune modulation, okay? That's really what they do. They do immune modulation because if the inflammation does not stop, the body cannot heal the thing. That's what we get when we have a tendinosis. The body has given up on trying to heal the tendon. That's why you need to get that immune modulation done. Now we can see here the various aspects of MSCs. They do antifibrosis, proliferation. A very interesting one, and maybe pertinent to what's going on in the world right now, is antibacterial and antiviral effect of LL37. For instance, this is what prevents a woman during her menstrual period from developing a sepsis, because think about it, you know, the uh, when a woman is menstruating, it's an area near, the, a lot of bacteria near there, et cetera. It should be a setup for a sepsis, and yet the menstrual blood is very rich in MSCs, no infection. Okay, MSCs basically, from the work of Prenault, they start as parasites on vessels. So it's not that they just <clears throat> can be found in bone marrow or fat, they're found everywhere where you have vessels, and these are the pre ones. So bottom line is uh, also you must realize with MSCs, if you're gonna use, let's say a allergenic one or something like that, these cells are not immune privileged. These cells are immune evasive. So I urge you to use caution. If you're using someone else's cells from an umbilical cord product or something like that, that you may eventually get an allergic reaction. These cells will elicit that. So keep it in mind. And there's a very classic article that I quoted there about that. Now, this is probably one of the most important articles in the whole talk right here. Immune modulation by therapeutic MSCs. You know, when we put MSCs in intravenously or we put them into a joint, they're only going to last at most a few days, but yet the effects can last for months or years. And the question is why? And, and this was given to me by uh, Arnie Kaplan. He told me, he said, this is probably one of the best articles to ever read because it explains how MSCs really work. And here it is here. You have your MSC, it gets phagotized by a monocyte. Now we start seeing how the immune system is really important in regenerative medicine, okay? So what happens eventually is that MSC eventually is sort of turned into an, a T regulatory cell. T reg cells are our buddies. Those are the cells that really prevent autoimmune diseases. These are the cells that help do tissue regeneration. These are the cells that are used, God forbid, if you have a cytokine storm from a COVID virus, these are the cells that will get you out of that storm. Okay, so that's the importance. Basically, the MSCs, if they're trapped in the lungs from intravenous use, they get phagotized by, mono, by monocytes and macrophages and eventually become Treg cells, okay? So Treg cells are very important, okay? And you can see here, this is the various types, and, and we'll see as time goes on how these cells and how you have different types of MSCs and different types of ma macrophages also. So like I say, stem cells and the immune system, you, if you don't want to learn about the immune system, you should not be doing regenerative medicine because you're not doing yourself and your patients a favor. Because when you start learning all these little intricacies, then you start learning how you can manipulate things and make things work better. And the immune system and stem cells are like this. They go hand in hand with each other, okay? So when we have the immune system, we have the T1, which is cell-mediated immunity. And we have T2, which is humoral immunity, which is basically antibodies and things like that. And it's as if I'm now giving a talk on the COVID-19 virus because these are all pertinent to that also. 
Okay, so we can see we have innate and we have adaptive immunity. And these are the various players in innate, which means we already have it here in an adaptive. Well, hopefully if you get the virus, you'll eventually adapt it and you'll get antibodies and you'll be able to fight it off. But initially you have to have this innate immunity help fight that uh, virus, okay? Now, here's the immune system in a nutshell. You have the Th1, which is basically autoimmune diseases, rejection, uh, makes it so your regenerative medicine procedure may not work so well. Then you have T2, which is non-autoimmune disease. It can help us. Then you have T17, which is, again is autoimmune and rejection. But we have my buddy here, the Treg cells, which basically graft tolerance, uh, really helps regenerate tissue, et cetera. Okay, now we start getting into some interesting things here now. All of a sudden, we, for years, everybody keeps talking about MSCs, MSCs. Well, an MSC is not necessarily an MSC. You have an MSC1, which is actually pro-inflammatory. And you have an MSC2, which is actually immune modulatory and basically trophic. It can actually help regenerate tissue. It depends on the neighborhood that cell is found in. You have a patient who basically is overwhelmed with a virus infection, such as COVID, for instance, he's going to have a lot of MSC1s. So it may not necessarily be as, as good as we think by giving someone intravenous MSCs and things like that, because some of these may get into, into MSC1s, which are pro-inflammatory, instead of MSC2s. But let's get into that a little more. So you start with a mesenchymal stem cell, depending upon how it's activated. And the activation is not that important. It's something called toll-like receptors. But it forms one of two types of MSCs. You start with an MSC, but then eventually you end up either with a pro-inflammatory MSC1, which can be great if you have a bacterial infection, a virus infection, et cetera. You know, one of the collateral damages is it does injure tissue. Now, if you have the right circumstances, you get an MSC2. That's where you're going to get immune modulation. You're going to get basically tissue regeneration, et cetera. So now you can start to see that, again, the immune system is very important. And you always want to try and see if you can get, uh, when you're doing regenerative medicine, this is the route we want to take. We don't want to go here because that's not going to help us. We really want to go here. And there are some little tricks to do with that. So we can see here the switches, okay? If you can get an MSC to go to an MSC2, you're going to prevent autoimmune diseases. You're going to have good regeneration. An MSC1 causes autoimmune diseases, et cetera. So there you are there. And I gave you some of the good literature that you can read more about this, okay? And again, MSC2 does immune modulation, does angiogenesis, mitotic uh, division, et cetera, anti-scarring. Where an MSC1, it's great for antimicrobial stuff, but not necessarily for regeneration. So keep that in mind. An MSC is not just an MSC. It depends on its neighborhood. It's an MSC1 or an MSC2. It's like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, okay? Now, when we talk about immunity, et cetera, we need to know more about the macrophages. They're what I call the center of the immune solar system, okay? And one of the tricks that we can do is if we can somehow really get some interleukin-4 into the environment, interleukin-4 can help us with the macrophages. Now, remember how we had an MSC1 and an MSC2? Well, the same thing exists with macrophages. Believe it or not, white blood cells can an MSC1, or excuse me, a macrophage 1 is pro-inflammatory, just like we thought always, taught in medical school, et cetera. All right, macrophages, yeah, they go and attack tissue and they basically get the bacteria, et cetera. Yes, that's true for, an MS, for a macrophage 1. But a macrophage 2 is immune modulatory. It releases IL-10 and helps promote tissue repair and resolve inflammation. I mean... You know, most of us, I remember at one time when I read that, I had to keep reading it over and over. I said, wait a minute, macrophages help produce tissue, help repair tissue? Didn't make any sense to me, but it does, okay? And this is, again, anti-inflammatory tissue remodeling, immune modulation, um, pro-tumor, okay? That's, you know, not a necessarily good thing, but, you know, we're not dealing with cancer in this case, hopefully. Now, an MS1, or excuse me, macrophage 1 is anti-tumor pro-inflammatory, so there you are, okay. Now, again, like I say, if you can put some IL-4 into your environment, it can help uh, polarize these to go to M2s, very important. But here's another slide that's important, look at this. You start with a macrophage, given the circumstances, 
if you have nitric oxide, um, it can actually cause inhibition of cell proliferation. But over here, if you have some arginase, it forms arnithine, which is a precursor of basically collagen, and you get cell proliferation and repair. So here it is, I'm showing you now that macrophages actually can also help proliferation and repair. So kind of like something you say, wait a minute, I never knew that before. Okay, next we want hematopoietic stem cells. I call those guys the army of stem cells. They really are responsible for a lot of repair also uh, by the principle of plasticity, okay? And they're found in very high numbers. They actually are the drivers of regeneration many times in vivo, not in vitro now. So a lot of good in vivo studies that show that, okay? And I'm you know, giving you that here. So they're the engine of in vivo tissue regeneration. Now get another favorite topic of mine is adipose tissue. Some of you may live in countries where you're allowed to do this. Some of you may live in countries where you're not allowed to break the adipose down. In the United States, I can't break it down with an enzyme. In the Cayman Islands, I can't. So I you know, have the ability to use both. So when you break fat tissue or adipose tissue down with an enzyme, you produce something called SVF. So I may take 60 or 100 cc's of fat, and maybe I get about two or three cc's of SVF from that um, compound. Very rich in mesenchymal stem cells. Let's go back a bit here. And we can see um, it's very rich in MSCs. Now let's kind of go here a little bit. Yeah, so here it is here, and you can see we're breaking all this down. We get the oil, we get the adipose tissue, we get the SVF right here, stromal vascular fraction. Very rich in MSCs and other regenerative type cells. And this is just another slide that shows the same thing, more or less. Now, the problem with SVF is you may be throwing away the baby with the bathwater. You may be getting rid of some very important regenerative cells found in fat such as mu cells, V cells, things like that. So basically, I'm not in favor of just using SVF. I like SVF, don't get me wrong, but I like to use it with fat also with a free fat graft, at least, if nothing else. Now, I think one of the things we may look into down the future, and I'm, I'm very intrigued by this. I was using it years ago, and I switched to another company now. Uh, it's called Joan Tech Labs, and it's basically nano fat. I think nano fat has a very good... Um, how shall I say, a very good way of probably giving us what we want to achieve. And it's a fairly reasonable way of uh, doing it and it's not that expensive. And I'm sure if you look up the company, you'll be able to get some more information on it. Okay. Now, we use fat also as a scaffold. I tell patients, look, when I do your procedure, I'm planting a garden, I'm using soil seeds and fertilizer. My soil is the fat, my seeds are regenerative cells from the fat and the bone marrow, and my fertilizer is the PRP. So that's how we do it. But I have to caution everyone, not all fat is the same either. There's a big difference between lead adipose and obese adipose tissue. And now we see again how the knowing about the immune system comes into play. Remember about Treg cells, they help drive regeneration, they help drive repair, et cetera. Look at the number of Treg cells here compared to here in obese fat. Look at the number of M2s, macrophage 2s, three to one. Okay, so all of a sudden, M1s and things like that, M2s, we see that adipose tissue that's lean has a much better chance of regenerating tissue than does obese. Now, we found that if we can pre-treat this adipose, or even if we use it as a fat graft and we put it into the joint and we just use, a, um, just use the patches, for instance, that I'm gonna talk about, we can actually go from obese to lean adipose. So keep it in mind, here's another picture that shows you the same thing. We don't want those M1s, we want the M2s. We don't want the uh, uh, macro, excuse me, the MSC1s, we want the MSC2s. That helps do that, okay? So again, just giving you some more information on this and you can see how that pendulous belly, that obese fat really is a bad thing. Now, mu cells, another interesting cell, uh, we found a way of maybe getting them from the peripheral blood. These are very in interesting cells. They're very uh, strong cells. They basically are stress cells. And we put them in a stressful situation such as a joint. They seem to do well. I think these cells may have some very good benefit for use in degenerative disc disease in the back and in the spine. I think they may be very well suited for that area because that's a very, very stressful area for a stem cell. 
and they're pluripotent and they're found in free fat grass, okay? So we're gonna look at it for discs. Now, bone marrow, I've been using bone marrow for 15 years. We do bone marrow with only local anesthesia. I have never used one bit of any kind of sedation or anything for bone marrow. It's not that much of a problem. Of anything we do in regenerative medicine, bone marrow is probably the most technique driven um, thing. Now, when you do your bone marrow, first of all, you must take it rapidly, okay? It's very important also to get it from different geographic areas. And what I do is I'll use a 10 cc syringe, and this is from the work of Dr. Mushler and Hernigal. And because that gives you the best pull, that 10 cc syringe, I'll put one cc of heparin in there, and I'll take about three to four cc's of marrow, and then I'll put that syringe down. I'll go to a different area and use a new syringe. So remember, no more than 10, milli 10, 10 ml syringe. That is the best thing of all, okay? Um, now, where should you aspirate from? Never use a long bone. If you're gonna use a long bone, you might as well just take whole blood because you're gonna get the same number of stem cells, more or less. I personally think a drill is not important, not good to use because I think it destroys more bone. I like to just go hammer down in because I'm getting my cortex, it's going down. And when I pull it up, I think we're gonna pull the cortex back up and it'll heal very quickly. The problem with bone marrow is as we age, the number of MSCs diminish rapidly, the number. Okay, so that's the problem. Now it's not total stem cell counts, okay? Because the next slide shows you that. I mean. Bone marrow still trumps everything as far as total stem cells. But when we're dealing just with MSCs, adipose has more fat per cc than bone marrow by far. Um, now, bone marrow, basically, the numbers of HSCs um, may increase in number, but their function declines. But overall, it stays about the same because although the cells don't work as well, you get more numbers and overall, it's about the same. So I'm giving you one little thing there. Now, what can help contribute to cell survival? Basically, hypoxic preconditioning. So they were talking about 24 to 48 hours. Well, guess what? Really, we did some studies and we found it was no more than 20 minutes was necessary. So one day I was kind of figuring out how to do this and I said, well, I can use, maybe I'll use a CO2 generator. So wait a minute, let me just put my bone marrow in a vacutainer. And that's what we do. We put our bone marrow in a vacutainer syringe for about 20 minutes. We're also using you know, photomodulation on it, which I'll get into shortly. And that seems to help quite a bit. Okay, so bone marrow versus fat, I believe you need to use both. There's some schools that only use bone marrow, some schools that only use fat. Listen, I like to be the Switzerland, I like to use both of them because I think that gives me the best results, okay? Now, the problem with bone marrow is if you start centrifuging it all, you may be throwing away some very valuable cell components, mu cells, V cells, exosomes, and cells of the immune system, okay? And there's a very classic article produced in 2012 that say that the V cells probably are discarded when you're doing uh, the uh, bone marrow centrifugation. So I'm not a big fan of just using centrifugation at all, alone. And years ago, I abandoned just doing centrifugation. I now do a hybrid of that. And that seems to give me the best results of all, okay? So, and I'm just giving you some ideas. You can go through these slides, you know, at your leisure. Um, so we feel that a purebred hybrid is the best thing of all. Uh, and we actually published a paper. Uh, one of our guest speakers is uh, my dear friend, Dr. Lana. He and I got together on this paper and we basically classified how bone marrow should be done. Uh, it's, it's a, a classification system. So we have bone marrow aspirate, bone marrow aspirate concentrate or a hybrid. And he and I are both of the opinion that a hybrid works the best. I've done thousands of thousands of cases and by far our results are best with the hybrid. So we have some bone marrow that's centrifuged, some that's not centrifuged. And it seems to give us the best results. And now the next step is, Dr. Lana may talk a little bit about it. We use bone marrow that will also have in it uh, possibly some clotted bone marrow. We think that may even make things work even better. So we'll have to go back and write another paper about this. And again, when we look at bone marrow versus PRP, look at interleukin-1 antagonist. Look at the amount there, 13,400 versus 588, same dosage, or excuse me, same amount. So that's why you want to use bone marrow many times. It's just going to give you a much better chance of success, okay? A little bit about exosomes. Basically, they begin as an endosome, which is a multivascular body. Remember, we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about the platelets, and then 
lo and behold, eventually it becomes an exosome, which is kind of like, I call it either like a DHL product or a, a FedEx product. It's kind of packaged and it goes to the right place at the right time. We still have a lot to learn though about exosomes. Now, exosomes are very similar to viruses. They act very similar. They have RNA and DNA. They basically can take control of the cell. Uh, so an exosome and a virus are very similar in many, many respects. Now, the other thing you should know and go over the slide at your leisure is the different types of RNA. Because again, you're gonna to need to know this because I can tell you the science is moving towards how we're gonna manipulate RNA in regenerative medicine to get better results. And you need to start having a working knowledge of this at least. Not that you can necessarily do this in your office initially, but I bet you it will down the road, but you need to know about that. Now, exosomes basically, let me go back to that one slide, double-edged sword in the United States, they're really not allowed by our FDA. And, and I think there's some validity to that because we still don't know what these things do. I think we need to learn about them more, but we'll get there one of these days. So what else do we use in um, regenerative medicine? Well, hyperbaric oxygen. This is from the work of Dr. Tom. And what Dr. Tom told us is the following. He said, hey, hyperbaric oxygen really works by a nitric oxide dependent mechanism. Nitric oxide, basically in this case, inducible, excuse me, endothelial nitric oxide synthase will stimulate your bone marrow to produce large numbers of stem cells and release it to the circulation. So basically, that's what goes on. Now, nitric oxide can have many different effects. You know, people with the COVID-19 virus and in a cytokine storm, it's because they have too much of the inducible nitric oxide synthase. Very good for fighting bacteria and viruses, but not very good for, you know, sparing tissue. It kills tissue. Now, the one I like is endothelial nitric oxide synthase. That's the one that basically increases vascularity, but it also increases stem cell release from the bone marrow. Now, there are some very good nitric oxide uh, synthase uh, uh, products on the market, uh, and I can give you those names, but uh, you know, in fairness to everyone, I don't wanna, this is for credits. We don't wanna start talking about specific products. Now, I think you're gonna have a talk about this uh, extra pulpural shockwave therapy. I use it on many of my cases. It results in really good results, okay? Now, let's get into a little bit about the science of it, basically. What does it do? It can change the cell membrane permeability can release neurotransmitters, it's antibacterial, releases nitric oxide and the delial synthase, and it can help in vessel growth and stem cell migration. But more importantly, here's a good study from a couple of years ago now, 2018. What it really did is it seemed to start helping the MSCs increase their mitochondria in size and efficiency, okay? And we can see that right here, okay? You have more mitochondria, you have a healthier cell, you're having more ATP, you have a cell that can really, can, can really do some good things, okay? Now, another thing about uh, shockwave therapy is it produces something called lubricin, okay? Lubricin is like a very high-powered hyaluronic acid. This is why shockwave therapy can work very well on tendons because that lubricin basically can help that tendon glide a lot smoother. Lubricin is very important in regenerative medicine, and we'll see as is hyaluronic acid, okay? So um, basically, that's why I think that lubricin may help. I think sometimes um, lubricin may be the answer why some bone-on-bone -bone osteoarthritis, the patient still say, doc, I don't really have too much pain. I'm still able to do things because probably the lubricin. It's like a very high-powered hyaluronic acid. Now, hyaluronic acid in itself is really a singling molecule. It's not just a lubricant. That's a, a really minor part of the whole situation. Um, and the other thing you have to realize about the, some of these studies, when they compare it to saline, saline is not a placebo, by the way. It has a therapeutic effect on it, so keep that in mind. Now, another thing I wanted to talk about is photoactivated PRP. We use photoactivation, photomodulation, however you want to call it, on all our products, be it a fat graft, be it the SVF, be it bone marrow, be it PRP. One of the things we know is basically it increases interleukin-1 antagonist, interleukin-2 antagonist. So it makes my white cells produce anti-inflammatory compounds. We think it's similar to orthokine, the German process. And there's some talk it may increase exosome production, although we're not sure about that. And here's a good article that shows you the effect of phototherapy on neutrophils. This is the, the kit that we're using right now, but we have a, a, a light stimulator that's gonna be much more efficient than this at a much better price than this. So just keep that in mind. Now. Some of the effects of phototherapy, basically it helps in the transcription 
of certain growth factors and basically turns on genes. When you start talking about transcription factors, it can help uh, increase stem cell proliferation, do all sorts of things, so to speak. And again, here we are with the transcription factors. Again, talking about messenger RNA and the different RNAs, we need to know these things if we're gonna really do regenerative medicine in the proper way, okay? So here's a summary of light therapy, but the real key is mitochondria are basically the principal photoreceptors. So if you can stimulate the mitochondria and stem cells, you're getting more ATP, you're making more energy, you're giving that cell a better chance of, of surviving. And this shows you the various light uh, that we use. Basically, red light is very important now. Just an article a couple of days ago, they said if someone looks at a red light every day for a couple of months, their vision will improve. And this is from a very prestigious journal. So there you are there, various colors. Now, why are certain joints more successful than others? I always said to myself, you know, the hips seem to be the one joint that doesn't do as well as the knees and the ankles. Well, lo and behold, there was an article from October of 2019. I think it comes from Duke University, if I'm not mistaken. And they said that basically, it seems that the more distal the joint is, it has younger proteins that are tied to an abundance of microRNA. Here it is again, the RNA that I'm talking about blocks the action of an RNA that inhibits production of new collagen. So lo and behold, that's why we now know why the hips don't seem to be as successful as a knee or an ankle. It's because these older proteins, okay? And, and it's a very good article. I suggest you read it. I gave you the little synopsis of it right here. Again, from Duke University, okay? So that's why your knees and ankles are gonna do better than your hips, okay? Now, cytokines, one of my, I, I, I'm fortunate to know a lady, Dr. Sorrentino, probably the world's expert on cytokines. She and I have been working together for years. Uh, cytokines basically control every problem in medicine. Um, you know, there's a whole host of cytokines and there's many different families in the cytokine family. When you talk about FGF, there's FGF6, FGF12, FGF22. It's not just one, it's many different ones. A lot of these cytokines are now recumbent DNA. Uh, they are basically clones of human cytokines. Uh, and we now use patches of a recumbent DNA. This, for instance, here, this may be, let's say, uh, a osteoarthritis patch, so it's going to be very rich in IL-4. It's going to be IGF-1, interleukin-10, some IL, uh, interleukin-1 antagonist. Put them on the joint and leave it on six, eight hours. It's mixed with penetrating molecules. I'm delivering growth factors to that joint to help me achieve my results. So this is called Similytics Technology. Um, we have a lot of information on it. It's now available in Europe and I believe in the Mideast. Uh, it's actually in Europe, it's now a class two medical device. So that's even another feather in their cap. So we can certainly give you some more information on this down the road. I'm just kind of giving you some information right now about it. Uh, but it will make a difference in all of your procedures because it's a very simple, easy thing to do. You just put it on a joint, penetrating molecule, six, eight hours. You put it with a tegaderm patch and you throw it away, okay? And again, just giving you some ideas as to how this works. <laughs> now, another um, aspect I wanted to talk about. About two years ago, I wrote a paper with uh, uh, a physical therapist. He's, he's a uh, professor of physical therapy at a local university. And we basically want to talk about PRP and how you should take, take care of the patient after, it, especially the sports medicine uh, professional, how you should take care of the patient afterwards. And here's some of our key points. Some of these are really going to shake you up. You're going to say, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. I was told you should never do that. Well, what we found, and we can find it and back up in the literature, use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories in ice is generally safe in the acute and subacute phases. Very important, okay? I have no hesitation giving a patient Advil, leave, ibuprofen, as long as it's medically okay right after the procedure. I can give it to them the day of the procedure. I've been doing it for 10 years with no fallback in my results. The other thing we notice is mechanical loading promotes a favorable microenvironment for the PRP and for success. And here we are here. It's something called mechanical transduction. When you stimulate a muscle, what happens eventually? Transcription factors come into play, certain cytokines are made, and you get success, okay? Now, a little bit about ozone therapy. Um, Ozone therapy is rather important. Ozone can produce many different effects. 
Many of the Italians have really had very good success of ozone in the joints and in the spine, et cetera. I've been using it now for a few years. I'm very happy with it. Basically what it does, it helps make NAD, okay? Nicotinamine adenine dinucleotide. It helps reduce inflammation. It reduces inflammation dramatically in the body. And it also, again, has NAD, NADH ratio. Those of us in regenerative medicine need to learn about NAD because it's very important. Again, it is with the health of the cell depends on the NAD, NADH ratio. And NAD is basically the cell's energy. It helps the cell produce ATP. So it's a rather important aspect there. Now, what else ozone does is it stimulates something called the NRF2 pathway. This is not some esoteric pathway now. This is the master regulator of reducing inflammation in the body. You know, people got into trouble with osteoarthritis, et cetera, because they had inflammation. If we get that inflammation down, it's going to make that situation better. And it's also going to make a much better environment for the stem cell itself. And again, some of the systemic effects of ozone, O3 therapy, platelets, um, more growth factors, better wound healing, less inflammation, antioxidants. So you can see there's a lot of interesting things that happen there. This is something that, that's very interesting. This is sort of a dialysis machine that we're using in our office now, but instead of it being dialysis for blood, it uses ozone as a dialyzing agent. And right here you can see this is a dialysis filter. Here's the blood from the patient. This is not for someone that has kidney disease. This is for someone who you basically want to improve their health their general well-being, you want to reduce their inflammation, this is what we do. Uh, and again, some of the far-reaching effects of ozone. And the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is stem cell aging pathways, because how cells age is how we age. And basically, if we can affect these stem cell aging pathways, again, we're going to have more success. Okay, so basically, one of the things we're talking about the sirtuin genes. Now, these are important in that look at all the different things that they can do here. I mean, you can, again, this is a slide we can spend the next, you know, half hour on. But the sirtuin genes basically control many aspects of the cell from cell division, et cetera, okay? Ultimately, it affects NAD. Now, here's the thing that we need to worry about with NAD and things like that. When you have a stem cell, a stem cell does not need very much energy. Okay, so it basically produces its energy by glycolysis. But when the stem cell is differentiating or helping in the differentiating process, it needs to switch over to oxidative phosphorylation. So you therefore need to basically get more energy. And how do you do that? By basically producing more ATP. NAD helps the cells produce more ATP. So make sure you give your patient an NAD supplement. It's so important to do, okay? AMPK, another important aspect that we need to worry about. Um, basically, it's a master switch of, uh, of cell functions, such as uptake of glucose, burning of fats, formation of new mitochondria. Simple, easy way to do this is a compound called barberine, B-E-R-B-E-R-I-N-E. -E. Uh, some of you may also know of metformin. Metformin, you know, there's a lot of people that take metformin and have no diabetes. They take it for anti-aging and basically anti-cancer. Uh, and it seems to be very beneficial in the stem cell field. We use it on patients. You know, I get this patient who seemed a little overweight or something like that. I'll go ahead and give him that. Another pathway one should know about is the mTOR pathway. Uh, again, I just mentioned these because it's something that you're going to see as time goes on. It's going to be in our orthopedic literature, in musculoskeletal regenerative medicine, et cetera. Uh, and basically, the rules for success in all stem cell procedures, you should boost your AMPK activity, suppress mTOR, increase NAD, importantly. And that's about it. Now, I guess we have time for questions, on, for a few questions anyway, I guess. A lot of material here, guys. I know that. Uh, thank you, Professor Pruta. Yeah, we have some questions. So I will bring... Uh... Dr. Humera. Hi, Professor. That was a fascinating talk. I'm Thank a you. rheumatologist. And um, I mean, as a rheumatologist, we are far behind in stem cell therapies. And uh, we're just using all our biological and anti-cytokine therapies. But we are using PRP for joints with synovitis. And my question was, 
do oral steroids, which many of our patients are taking, the small dose of oral steroids alter the efficacy of PRP in the joints? Well, first of all, uh, are you using PRP for um, a, let's say, a hot rheumatic or rheumatoid arthritis joint? Yes, we are. And we no. have documented efficacy with ultrasound. Uh, showing that the Doppler signal goes down and the synovitis does decrease. So. Because sometimes you got to realize though, sometimes you're using VEGF and that can actually increase the vascularity in there. So you got to be a little careful about that. I myself, I don't, I've looked and I haven't found good literature to say that cortisone is detrimental. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, small doses of dexamethasone can actually act, and I'm talking very small doses, can act as a growth factor. So I'm not that opposed to using some cortisone if need be. Once in a while, if I have a patient who's not quite getting where they need to be, I'll give them a small little amount of cortisone. I, I think that's okay. It's an anti-inflammatory. You know, I told you, I've used anti-inflammatories for at least 10 years with no hesitation on any of my patients. All right. Thank you. I think Dr. Adil uh, Ibrahim, you can ask your question. Dr. Adil Ibrahim. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can ask your question. Thank you so much for this fascinating lecture. Uh, but I want from practical point of view, uh, what is the best uh, option for uh, uh, meniscal tear and osteoarthritis? What, because you know, all this agent mentioned in the lecture, lot, a lot of subjects. Lot of, uh, uh, can you please uh, elucidate, uh, elucidate, uh, highlight this point, please? You know, unfortunately, I couldn't really quite hear because we have a bad connection. If you could kind of maybe repeat the question, what is the best option for what now? Osteoarthritis of the knee and for meniscal injuries. Well, okay, osteoarthritis of the knee, what I use typically is in the United States, I will use bone marrow, I will use PRP, and I will use fat, and I will use my cytokine growth factors, and I'll put them on some oral growth factors at the same time. If I'm in the Cayman Islands, I may use SCF in addition to those. Uh, that seems to work the best for me. I typically will follow that by two PRP injections spaced about a month apart. Uh, I will place the patient in physical therapy right away. I may put patches on them, again, cytopine patches between my injections. The PRP injections are done about a month apart, like I say. Okay, so I think I can ask you a question on the behalf of the attendee. So for osteoarthritis of the knee, like uh, for the PRP, you are, if you're using PRP, how many injections you're using and at what interval? Well, when, again, uh, when I do my first injection, it's bone marrow, PRP, and fat. Okay. Uh, and then I will follow that by two PRP injections spaced a month apart. The amount of PRP I'm using is probably, once it's processed, about seven cc's. Right. So which grade, uh, are you using uh, culture expanded stem cell also? Uh, you know, it's interesting. In the United States, it's absolutely not allowed, but we're about to start launching a project in the Cayman Islands where we're gonna use culture expansion, at least initially of SVF. I think that's gonna make a difference for us. We'll see. And for but the I'm, not, I'm not gonna abandon my bone marrow. I'm gonna do it with bone marrow. I just think, you know, you need to have the whole complement of cells. So for the BMAC, you like to use only one injection of BMAC, and then you continue with PRP and uh, the fat? I would say probably about 97, 98% of my patients only get one injection of the BMAC. Uh, it seems to, that seems to work for me. So that's what I'm doing. Now. So are you giving only within the joint, like intra-articular, or are you using intra also? Um, no, I'm basically giving intraarticular. I mean, I know there's some literature out there that says you can do it uh, interosseous, but I've had good results with intraarticular. And, you know, if you talk to Dr. Hernigal, he's had very good results with it also. So I have no real pressing reason to go and, and, and do inter, uh, interosseous. Right now, it doesn't seem to be, you know, necessary. If, if I get results that don't work, okay, I'll switch over. All right. What about the grade four osteoarthritis with deformed, painful knee? They knee, total knee but sometimes the patient are not fit for the surgery or they don't want surgery. So do you think uh, in your experience, it helps symptom wise? Of course, structurally it can't do much. So what is your experience for that? My, my experience is actually pretty good because I have a number of people, you know, living in Florida that have a number of medical problems that may not allow them to have a knee replacement. 
and we'll do it. If we have a valgus or varus deformity that's pretty significant, I'll get an unloader brace for them. But what we found is that we can dramatically reduce their pain and inflammation. You know, I tell patients, stem cells work in two ways. They can maybe regenerate the articular cartilage, but just as important, they change the chemistry of the joint so it's no longer inflamed. Right. Thank you, sir, for your excellent talk and bringing your voice experience to this area and 